<clears throat> Hi, everybody. <laughs> Good to see you again. Yeah, I know. Same thing. <clears throat> this one is titled, and I want to make this real clear here. Why did I leave the church? It's not a church. Why did I leave from what I was raised and known after I was born again? Um, one of the things is, and you know I gotta have my notes, I just have to keep up with them so I keep my flow. I did not set out to become a heretic. Where I'm at as I'm making this video is a product of several years of searching and studying scripture. And I, I <laughs> the other night I, I was chatting with a friend of mine on there and uh, I thought about my diary. I'd forgotten about that. I had a diary that I was keeping, logging different events that I felt the Holy Spirit had showed me, different events, different truths. Uh, you know, I, I shared in one of my other videos that I was downloading something and that my eye caught the first word of a page eight and I wrote it down out of 117 pages. And when I, after I printed it out and I looked at page eight and it was the two paragraphs exactly were the answer that I was looking for. And I can't make that up on my own. I, I just can't, you know, and stuff. So, um, I have a few dates here. I did set out on March 18th, 2018, and I was a seriously studying in and outside of the box. I wanted to know the truth. I wanted to really have the Holy Spirit show me what's going on. And he, I know he speaks through people and speaks through his words through different things, but um, I, uh, I was looking inside the box and outside the box. I started presuming that everything I believed was wrong. And so I went from that premise and uh, comparative, co yeah, comparative contrast is the revealer of truth. Comparative contrast is the revealer of truth. And so I started looking at all different religions in the Christian realm that and how they view different subjects and I started comparing them and I'm a night person and so I uh, every night uh, I have my own room and stuff my wife used to work nights since we got used to sleep in a different rooms and now we love it and stuff and uh, but I started out 15 or 20 minutes every night and pretty soon it spiked it's like the Lord was showing me all kinds of things. As I looked through scripture, looked up the context, I looked at who said it, who, who they were talking to, what is the definition of the words, and I started subject searching. I've told you guys that several times. Subject searching is one of the best ways to learn and understand something. And that got to be to the point over several years that I couldn't wait to go to bed. I couldn't wait to study. I'd come home from work, I'd get my book work done, I'd make my calls for my customers, and then I'd, I'd head out. Uh, go up there. Sometimes I get there early. People know not to call me after 9 p.m. because that's when I go up and do my study time. And so, uh, 9 22 19, 2019, through study, I thought I may be called to be a watchman. They talk about that in Ezekiel 33 6 through 9. And one of the things us guys have to watch out for is pride. We think more highly of ourselves than we should and I started thinking I was a watchman for a while and I started telling people that until I ran into a couple of verses where it implied that the Father calls you to be a watchman and I couldn't trace back in any of my history where he had called me to do that and so I set that aside one of the things you're going to find when you're studying scripture we do the pendulum swing we seem to go from one extreme to the other every one of the subjects and topics and you'll find that when you're when you're watching videos. I mean, there's people that are incredibly smart and educated in some areas of their set study, and other areas they're as far out left field as you can get. So I'm probably in the same category. Uh, 10, 19 of 2019, I have no doubt that the Holy Spirit, when I say the Holy Spirit, I'm talking about a still soft voice, a clarity that He speaks in your heart or your mind where there's no doubt you fully understand exactly what he says even with just one word and he said there's a famine of my word as i started looking that up 
I uh, also seen that there's a sin of Samaria. I'm totally not understanding this stuff. Uh, and there has been teachings that disagree with this, but I'm just going to share the things that I studied up on. The sin of Samaria is Israel borrowed gods from the surrounding nations. They combined their worship with that of the true God, Yahweh. By changing his nature, they destroyed the right image of the true God, of Yahweh. This in turn changed the source of beliefs, the ideas, the laws, standards, ethic, morality. Thus, when a feminine Yahweh's word comes from Amos 8.11, immorality swiftly sets in. Oh, he's such a loving God. He's also an angry God and a jealous God. But at the time, I didn't realize a lot of this. And Dan was a local, was the location of one of the sanctuaries that Jeroboam one, first Jeroboam, set up to imitate the temple of Jerusalem in 1 Kings 12, 29. His counterfeit, which I, this is all going to play in there, guys. The counterfeit sanctuary was made of a holy of holies. Instead of cherubim, it was two golden calves arranged to form the base of a counterfeit mercy seat. Over the years, the invisible presence of the calves became feminine to the Israel, oh, familiar to the Israelites, who soon were worshiping the calves as God. And more time after more time, the nature of the calves became the nature of Yahweh. See, one of the key things. Is changing and making a counterfeit but it all seems religious and right I found myself starting to stand up for God I was caring what people thought of him and said about him as you study and spend time with the Lord when I went up there to me it was my holy of holies I always went well with socks on but without shoes I thought, okay, Lord, I'm sending your presence. I don't have to be prepared to get into your presence. I always ask him if my life, if I need to confess sins or deal with stuff. But I want to be in his presence. And that really started changing my heart attitude when I heard people say stuff about him. And this is a, a, one of the key things that I started noticing. Around 10 27 of 2019, our church had a prison ministry team come to do a weekend thing for men, like an outreach. I wanted to be open. I expected God to do something. Well, he did. I was so uneasy and bothered by their lies. They were a Calvinistic teaching and they're bearing false witness to my Father in heaven and I could not stand it. But I was not the one in charge to protect the body from lies. I had one I had one on one with one of the leaders. The guy never looked at me again the rest of the weekend. He never talked to me or anything. Matter of fact, they even cut me out. I was supposed to go to one of the prisons, and I'm certified to go to the prisons. But they said they didn't think I was ready. But they were manipulating the pastor. See. Shortly later on, feeling like I'm the bad guy, we had trouble with our printer. My local pastor at one service made fun of the Holy Ghost, made fun of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He mocked, openly mocked, and the whole congregation laughed at tongues. And uh, I was just beside myself. And you know, there's always two sides to every story and, and stuff, but I was so grieved and hurt that night that I had to confront him and I had to deal with it. And that I didn't know how to deal with it. I ended up walking out and it's like, in his eyes, I was probably being stupid and selfish or whatever, but I had never grieved for the Father like I grieved. I was almost sick to my stomach. He talked about the Holy Spirit's gifts of tongues and laughed at it. and got everybody to laugh publicly. And, uh, of course, he probably didn't say anything was wrong, but this isn't about him. This is about the experiences that I started seeing for myself. See the changes? I am now carrying much for the Heavenly Father. May 17th of 2020, Revelations 2, verse three and five, between 3 and 5, I realized that I've returned to my first love. 
I had successfully yielded to the fear of God against lust. And I had been walking blamelessly before the Lord. And it's like, he showed me that I have come back to my first love, which is him. Not the church, not the Bible, not, it's, it's a relationship. 8220. My pastor said that we were just in conversation, passing, you know. My pastor said that every day you pick, you can pick any day you want to be your Sabbath. And again, something did not set right with me. Every, any day that I pick can be my Sabbath. That's a freedom in Christ. And I started doing searching. And I started searching up how the Jews viewed it, how, uh, you know, all the, all the different things. And a good friend tipped me off and tipped me off that there was a couple teachers online I should listen to. And as I started studying and going through, I realized the Torah was still full in, fully in effect. I always say it's like the operational death star, but it's a life star. And the instructions in the Torah, I have a lot to learn about it, but I realized that Father never said to anybody they had the right to change his Sabbath, Sabbath day. And the one thing I want to stress through this talking is I've learned to separate the state of the Jews, Jewish people, from God's children, the Father's children, those who are willing to walk in His ways, in His light, in His commandments. The next day, I changed my Sabbath and I enforced the unclean food laws. I wanted to. I talked to my wife about it. And really, there was only like three or four food groups that I had to get rid of. The rest of them I didn't like anyway. And the Sabbath, actually, I even shared with another friend of mine, another businessman, and he said, it works great for him because you get off Friday. That's our Sabbath start from the sunset to the, the Saturday night when the sun sets, it's, it's over or whatever. And I have found I get, anyway, it's been an absolute blessing. See, so I'm going, okay, so I've been wrong about this all, all, all my Christian life, okay? I just simply wanted to please the Father. Shortly after that, you run into people, the proper names people, and have to short, sort that out. All through this trial, as I'm learning, ooh, we get down these rabbit trails, down this rabbit trail. And pretty soon it's like, ooh, I gotta back out of here, I'm gonna get stuck in this, or I'm not looking at this right, or these people say I'm not doing this right. Nobody seems to agree on anything. And that's why you and me have to talk to the Spirit and walk with the Spirit. See, I found so many things that I was taught that was wrong. And I kept saying, Father, how can the Bible, the Holy Bible, be so hard and misleading if it's your word? 10, 26, 20. I found a friend that, I found a friend, there is no, he, I told the friend that there's no contradiction in the scripture. I told him to prove it. He did. I spent two nights working on to prove him wrong, but through word searches, I kept finding more and more contradictions in the Bible. All these years, how did I not see this? But it's all involving one person, it's Paul. Then I accepted, once I accepted the possibility that Paul could be a counterfeit, the text proved it to be true. Then it was Jesus' words against Paul's words. How can I deny what I am reading? If I believe the Bible to be true, that doesn't mean it's inerrant. It could be true. It has a test in the Bible. To see, how are we supposed to know what a counterfeit person is like until he actually shows us it? And we compare it. And I started studying church history. And anyway, but the light went on. The famine of the Word of God was hidden by the false gospel of Paul. Father showed me that there's a famine of his word. And I don't know of any church right now that teaches the gospel of Jesus Christ and how to keep his commandments and the feast days and the Torah, all that stuff. The sin of Samaria was mixing Jesus' words with Paul's lies and changing the character of God. Oh, God is so loving. His grace will save you. You don't have to worry about it. He died for all your sin. All this stuff changes the character of God. People don't realize that. 
It's not the fact of which doctrine or which church you went to. How does this view the character of God? The sin of Samaria. All this started clicking in my head. Father started walking me through, but I just couldn't see it until the Holy Spirit reveals it in His Word. Now I have to warn others. As I shared my teachings on Facebook with others, the pastor started using his sermons to shoot judgmental jabs at me. Instead of sitting down and saying, hey, let's talk this over the way you're sharing on here, he starts shooting me down in the middle of service, on camera, video to other people. And I thought, this is not right. This is not right. See, over the years, I've seen pastors, this is general speaking, I've seen pastors want people to come to them. Their doors are always open. Please keep in touch. Hey, we haven't talked for a while. Seems, see, it all sounds good, but they want you to come to them. Their time's more valuable. I've watched pastors laugh at people behind their back after they said, <laughs> like they want to spend time with me, like I got time for them and stuff, and it's sad. Leadership, I cannot... The one thing I learned through this, too, it's on another video. If I support somebody in their lies and encourage them in their lies, it doesn't change the lies of truth. Their hearts are still committed to a false teaching. And though we all have to sort out our teaching, I cannot back up somebody's lies. And even that, that group, that Calvinistic group, if they ever came back, I would not show up. There's no way. I finally told my wife, wife's are a good sounding book, book uh, whatever it is, sounding board. I finally told my wife, I think the reason I break down during confrontation with pastors or leaders of churches is that I was verbally abused my whole life. I was taught to cower. My dad used to tell me in high school, how come you don't take and stick up for yourself once you fight? My dad was verbally abusing me. He taught me to cower whenever confronted. So when a bully abuses me, I cower. And what I'm seeing is a lot of pastors are verbal manipulators. Good, good preachers know how to use their word, their language, their tone of voice to sound affirmative. Even those from prison, Cons can be spiritual cons. And what's funny is I've been in business for about 32 years. And I work with state authorities. I work with architects, uh, local governing bodies, customers. And I can stand up to them. I don't cower. I know what's right. I know what needs to be done. I know how to build this. I know what's going on. But churchy people seem to know how to work your emotions. And they can con you. And that's what's scary because I don't want to manipulate you guys or anybody. I want you to see and learn to hear the Holy Spirit on your own. You've got to learn to hear Him and, and seek Him and give your life totally to Him, the, to God, the Father. Churchy people can emotionally wreck you and control you. That's how cults get going. But that's how some of these megachurches are. They make you feel so good. I'm in God's grace. <laughs> it's not. Jesus never said a word about that. As of this video, my goal for doing this is to show the direction that the Lord has brought me to through, brought me through study and testing Scripture to Scripture, that He will lead me into all truth. It's lonely, folks. It is so lonely. A heretic is somebody who goes against all the flow. And you know what verse people like to throw at me all the time? They say, well, Marty, it says in the end times, many will be deceived. Read the history of the Bible. Read every, all the Old Testament. The many are the masses, the majority. The majority are deceived. They're following Pauline doctrine. They're not even, they don't want to test it. They'll turn around and even if I do a slight hint of questioning Paul, they'll cut me off. Because they like their faith is in his gospel and not in Jesus. Jesus did not come to start a new religion, people. He came to strip down some of the garbage that the Jews put on there so that we would follow and be his children. We're the sojourners. Well, I'm not a Jewish by blood, but I'm a sojourner. I've been, yeah. 
And some, again, with Paul, Paul's a great counterfeiter. He's perfect. He knows his stuff great. He's a Pharisee. He knows how to take one word and twist it. Seeing Paul's lies has freed me up and given me peace and a whole new sense of walking blamelessly before my God. You know how many people tell me they're always going to be sinners and that we're always going to sin? What did Jesus set you free from? That's all Paul doctrine. It's all Pauline stuff. Once you understand what sin is, then you can see making a mistake is not sin. It's sinning is breaking God's laws. Jesus warned us of the leaven of the Pharisees, but it came sooner than anybody would ever know. It came sooner. Satan had to get his foot in the door with the high-centered people. He had to get an inside man into the church. He had to get a man who could write, read, and do everything that he wanted so the other people would believe it. P.S. Watch out for rabbit trails. They will take you off course. Remember your first love. Remember what the Father has done for you in your life. I shared that with a number of people. What we believed about the Bible brought us to this point. What the Holy Spirit has done in my life, what, what the Father's done, it doesn't void all this stuff out. He's brought me back to my first love. And I told you guys back in January of this year, 21, that I had COVID. And that he showed me very clearly that Paul took salvation away from Yeshua. That Paul made salvation a gift in itself, a goal in itself, a reward in itself. He lifted up salvation and not the Son. And the Lord gave him the joy of my Lord back. <laughs> gave me the joy of my gave me the joy of the Lord back. Yeah, gave me the joy of the Lord back. And so uh, uh, I want to I, I, I'm going to stand before him, and at this moment in time, I don't know which way to go, other than I got to keep seeking him, and that he wants to raise up a remnant, and there are people out there on the websites now that we're getting together, and uh, in my own local town, it's lonely. Um, I've had a few people question, but I think as we take a stand, as we keep studying and learn how to communicate the information to people properly, and not just slam it up against them but slowly bring it in and make them have a question or a doubt in their mind that maybe we need to check into this, then the Holy Spirit can work in their lives. It's plant seeds, you know. And the wheat seeds and the parable, the wheat seeds and the weeds, and the wheat seeds, they both died, they both were alive, they both grew up in plants, but one grew up to become a weed and the other one grew up to become wheat. And we're gonna be judged by our fruit. Father God, I am so grateful for you. I'm so, absolutely thrilled that you're still even willing to talk to me. I pray, Father, that this video will reach out to several people and help people who are in questioning and people who are struggling, Lord. I've watched people go through this. It is an emotional thing. And if they can focus on you as being our state stability, then they can deal with the doct doctrinal issues. I haven't changed. It's just my heart and my focus and my thinking has changed. And even my lifestyle. Father, please, through your Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll, you'll keep drawing people who are seeking you. Because you said you will be found. But Lord, I'm worried because there's a time, there's several places in the Old Testament where you said to the prophets that I, I, they will not hear from me. I'm going to turn my back on them. I'm going to walk away from them. And that's frightening, Lord. Please don't walk away from us. Help us to seek out the remnant. Help us to, to help the remnant to grow. In your son's precious name, Jesus, Yeshua. Amen.